Welcome to a new episode of the Beginner's Mind uh, Life Science Get Together podcast. Today on the call from the United Kingdom is Professor Sriram Supramanian. I hope I spell your name right. Welcome to the show. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Uh, Good to see you. How is uh, you are in London currently? Is that right? Uh, yes. Well, I, I'm, I don't physically live in London, but mm -hmm. yes, uh, that's where my job is. Yeah. How is uh, at University College London? Yeah. Oh, great. How is yeah. life in London currently? Um, uh, well, we are all going through the lockdown in different ways. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, we will come out of it nice, uh, but we have to see. Um, so I, at the moment, uh, things are slowing, uh, are okay. So mm -hmm. that's uh, positive. And I think the number of cases are going down here as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, we're getting ready for Christmas, whatever that may be. And how <laughs> that holiday season is going to look. So, yeah. yeah, we are curious to find out it's the same here in Austria. Uh, yeah. But regardless, I think uh, we are currently in a time where everybody is going online. So it's it has really yeah. given a great push towards the digital world. And tell me a little bit more about your research. I think you are is exactly in that space. Uh, yeah, that's right. So I'm a professor of computer science at UCL. And um, uh, we work um, in, in a research area called human computer interaction. So we are interested in creating new types of computer uh, interfaces for connecting people, for making it easy for humans to interact with computational systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and specifically in my case, I'm, uh, I, I work in this uh, area called mid-air haptics. So we are trying to recreate the sense of touch, but without touching anything, right? So that's, uh, 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 very important these days, uh, but I've been working on this topic now for the last 10 years. Uh, the idea is uh, we want people to um, to um, to get the sense that they're touching and feeling objects, which is very, very mm -hmm. important. Uh, but uh, we also don't want them to physically make contact. So the way we do that is we use uh, uh, ultrasound. So we create uh, ultrasonic speaker arrays that um, uh, generate um, uh, acoustic patterns. Uh, and when, uh, when these patterns hit your hand, you can feel them. So as if I were to give you an analogy, this is a bit like, uh, you know, if you go to a rock concert and you feel the music in your chest, right? <laughs> and it, and it uh, so you can feel it literally, yeah. you can hear yeah. the music, but you can also feel the music in the chest. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. But uh, um, uh, so uh, what we, we are doing is instead of, uh, feel it in your chest, we give them uh, the uh, sound in your hand so you can feel it. Uh, and then, and you also don't want to hear the sound uh, sometimes. So we moved ultrasound. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's a great thing. That's mostly what we do, yeah. yeah that's a great thing. Um, since when are you doing this research? Uh, so we started this work in 2010. 2010. Uh, yeah, so, uh, we, uh, and slowly, working our way through the different aspects of it. Uh, I, I think uh, sometimes, you know, great things come from naive mm -hmm. ideas. So mm -hmm. uh, in 2010, we thought this should be possible to do. Uh, and and uh, I, I, I had an undergraduate project student and I told him to do it. Uh, and, and then we, I think we slowly realized that this is bigger than a, a one undergraduate student working on his project. Um, so yeah, that's uh, where it all started uh, as an undergraduate project. Really, really small scale. So one person working on that. And uh, in the preparation of this podcast, if I got it right, uh, five or six years later, in 2015 or 16, you pushed the idea so far that uh, you could spin out a, basically a company from... Uh, was... oh, almost right. Um, but not, uh, the timing is slightly different though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, um, uh, it was 2013 that mm -hmm. we spun the company out. Actually, just a week ago, we celebrated seven years. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Uh, company. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we, um, uh, so Tom Carter was the undergraduate project student at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I convinced him that uh, it's a good idea to, to do a PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, after the undergraduate, so he stuck around for the PhD uh, on the condition that he can also do a spin out if the idea is interesting. 
uh, I said, well, why not? That sounds like a great thing to do. <laughs> uh, and and uh, well, 2013 seemed like a right moment for us to um, to spin the company out because we had lots of interest, commercial traction, uh, mm-hmm. and, and uh, yeah. And you had you had commercial traction already three years after starting with the idea. That's amazing. Uh, yes, yes. So we, I, I think we were quite lucky because we were able to uh, demonstrate a proof of concept prototype. Really, uh, in three years. Uh, yeah, he was a hardworking, amazing uh, student. So uh, he, we had a prototype that was uh, that we could demonstrate. Mm-hmm. So uh, we also got lots of press interest, uh, mm-hmm. and, and all of that meant we actually had companies coming and asking us if they can buy it uh, even uh, even before founding the company uh yes even before founding the company yeah. and 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 part of the process for accelerating the founding of the company was we realized that it was not like one off request mm-hmm. right i mean sometimes you can you can get a request from someone saying oh can i buy your product and then you think oh this is an amazing <laughs> idea let's start a company yeah, you yeah. The company and the next you know there's only one client for you who wants to buy one of your thing and that's it uh, but no, I, I think um, we, we had sustained uh, interest and request. Uh, but I, I think it's a, it's, a, um, it's a two-way street, isn't it? In a way, uh, we were looking for those opportunities because we knew that there is something uh, uh, on this idea that could be commercially exploited. Mm-hmm. So because we were also looking, we were receptive to uh, those uh, uh, communications from different companies. And, and, and things came together nicely. Mm-hmm. How, how was the process of uh, actually founding the company? You had already commercial traction, founded the company, and which challenges did you, did you find on this way? Uh, well, challenges are many. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's, uh, 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 that in a way it keeps you interested and, and uh, it keeps you going uh, mm-hmm. uh, if it's all you know, rosy then probably you will lose interest quickly. But um, some specific challenges were, um, uh, you know, so we uh, we had to spin out the company from the university and there were uh, IP negotiations that had to be done with the mm-hmm. institution. Mm, uh, then, uh, yeah, you need to raise capital uh, uh, for the company and that's uh, uh, something that uh, takes a while. And, uh, yeah. In the early days of any business, uh, when you have clients and customers who want to buy something, they know that they have the upper hand. So they're always waiting, right? They're interested. They say, oh, uh, this is an amazing idea. I want to buy it, but can you do this little thing, please? Uh, And and, uh, uh, if you are naive, um, and and, and, uh, I I, I would say that we were both, or three of us, we were three co-founders, were mm-hmm. quite naive and we would yeah. go and start implementing all the requests that we got uh, until we had the first uh, investor coming and telling guys just tell them to buy what you have now here yeah. pay the money yeah. if you want it take it otherwise we will go talk to some other client that's, uh, and, that, that's, and, a, that's a great point i think apple is doing it quite interestingly uh they put a new version on the market every year so all requests <coughs> are put in that. Did you go? Did you go the same route with your product, so that you make a version one, version two, version three? Uh, we are not so much a software company as a, a devices company. Yeah. So that, I mean, of course, to a large degree, that is happening inevitably, because um, you first have one product, uh, and then you realize, okay, this this is a one size fits all solution and that's not how it works you need to customize it for different markets and segments Mm -hmm. and then you start giving uh, options to people right so you uh, customizable or uh, different scales and variations and so on so we do that as well yeah so how was uh, uh, so now the company is doing that a lot yeah yeah how was the fundraising process initially how did that go um so we uh, we have to say the um uh, the, it was very good. In I mean, I described it as a challenge to mm-hmm. spin out of the company and uh, you know, like do the, all the investor uh, founder agreements and uh, share share agreements and so on. But at the end of the day, it was helpful to go through that process because uh, the university was on your side, uh, and being a university spin out meant uh, the university was helping us in the beginning to uh, to get in touch with uh, the right investors. And and uh, and there was also seed funding available from 
uh, from university sources. So that was very helpful uh, in getting us going. Um, it's quite interesting. Yeah. I think the fundraising process when, when somebody is spinning out the technology from university is key to success. How much time did it take to, um, from, the, from the idea, from the first realization that you and your team and your co-founders need money until you really get, get the money on your bank account? Uh, you know, it's never finished. That I think is the one realization uh, 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 that I have come to is uh, you're always you always get enough money mm -hmm. to keep going, but mm -hmm. as soon as you finish your round, you need to start getting ready for the next round of funding because <laughs> you know the money is going to finish soon. Right? Uh, so yeah, I, it's never uh, finished. Uh, in the beginning, uh, the university had some agree uh, agreements with um, uh, with the pre-seed investment company, the IP group, uh, and, and they uh, they gave us uh, uh, they, they gave us some funding to to get the prototypes out uh, as uh, development kits and uh, demonstrators to different companies, but also they they helped uh, Tom develop. Uh, his uh, leadership and mentoring skills and so on. So, and, and so that was also very useful in, uh, in helping us grow the business. So uh, it was not just about giving us money. It was mm -hmm. more than giving us money, right? So that was very yeah. useful. Yeah. Now that's good. I mean, investors that usually work in that spot have a lot of uh, a good network, a lot of know-how themselves, how to run a company, how to yeah. build companies. And I worked in many VCs companies at an, as an executive. And I always loved the coaching from VCs because they really help to focus the team on what's essential yeah. and uh, yeah. step out. Yeah. The point that you made, I think, is, 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 very, is really key to success that you said, you said um, fundraising never stops. Fundraising. So once you close your rounds, you you have to be ready to the next round. And I think yeah. this is sound advice to all scientific entrepreneurs to yeah. not see it as a one-off event. Let's switch a little bit from fundraising to the technology. You founded yeah. a company in 2013. You closed the round and uh, you celebrated seven years. Uh, how far did the technology advance? What are the applications that you see today? That, uh, well, so, you know, in back in 2013, when we launched the company, I mean, I have to say, we didn't think that uh, that there would be so many customers and clients interested in the idea. But even for those who came, it was a, f a future uh, musing, let's say, like, so something interesting, let's try. Uh, um, and, and like I said, the idea is that you don't have to touch anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have gesture control and you get haptic feedback with the yeah. gesture control. Uh, and, and I would say uh, until last year, there was, uh, um, uh, there was a, a steady good interest from different companies, be it gaming companies or, uh, you know, kiosks or uh, VR applications and so on. But, uh, uh, in a good way or a bad way, the current crisis okay. brought everything to its head, right? I mean, today uh, we don't have to I don't have to explain to anyone the importance of touch. Everybody understands, right? The newspapers are full of how grandmothers are not able to hug their grandchildren and the sense of touch is important. And, and, and yet contact, physical contact is tricky because uh, of the spread of uh, germs, infections, whatever that may be. Um, and so uh, everybody understands the need for a touchless system that will mm -hmm. enable you to touch something. So, uh, so yeah, today there is a lot of uh, appetite and interest uh, from uh, uh, ATM machines to, you know, railway station uh, ticket uh, mm -hmm. counters uh, to uh, cinema kiosks. They all want to uh, fit their, uh, uh, their uh, kiosks mm -hmm. with uh, uh, touchless interfaces. So uh, there's a lot of this. Touchless interface. How, do, how does it look like? How does it work? So, so the the um, so imagine that you go into a um, 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 a supermarket, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, nowadays it's possible that you can have a um, uh, you you can do a self service checkout, mm -hmm. <clears throat> right, in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, typically that self service checkout is a is a system where you have to press buttons, right? So you mm -hmm. say how uh, uh, whether you, you confirm that all your uh, items in your uh, bag has been scanned, you confirm how many bags you have. You, you, you say whether you want to pay by credit card or uh, how you want to pay, 
So you know, all of these are interactions that you touch the screen. Um, and and uh, what we offer is a solution where you don't have to touch the screen anymore. You wave your hand in front of the screen. Okay. And the screen detects your uh, hand gesture uh, and, and it gives you tactile feedback. So you, so you know you confirmed your, you've done your actions correctly. So you get some feedback on your hand yeah. uh, and, and you, can, uh, you can finish your interaction with that kiosk without actually touching uh, most of the kiosk. Uh, this, this would be amazing because currently politicians and scientists are pushing towards the direction uh, mm -hmm. that because of SARS-CoV-2, we should avoid touching anything yeah. in public. So yeah. it, it reminds me of a, of a movie with Tom Cruise. I think it was 20 years ago or something, Minority Report, yeah. where he basically pulled up in front of him yeah. uh, all the interfaces. And you always wondered how he can, how he can feel where he's touching because you see it yeah. and then you don't know, did I hit it or did I not hit it? If I got yeah. it right, you really can simulate uh, the point where you usually touch the interface so that the user knows exactly the point in time when uh, he hit the right or she hit the right button. Is that, That's it... right. Yeah. So we, we can, uh, we track the fingers using camera. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so there's a, there's a difference between minority report uh, scenario uh, and the scenario that uh, we live in today, right? Uh, uh, firstly, if you watch the movie carefully, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, uh, Tom Cruise in that movie was wearing a glove. To, ah, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So that it was easy for uh, the system to see his hand and to do the tracking, True, yeah. right? Uh, you don't need to do that here. You don't need to wear anything. So just walk up and use. Okay, first thing. Second thing is, uh, yeah. uh, so it, it's difficult in, in any visual uh, environment to convey mm -hmm. the sense that the person uh, uh, has received a tactile feedback, mm -hmm. right? So, so in the, in the uh, Minority Report movie, he actually physically touches the glass panel. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need to touch anything here. So you um, you wave your hand in front of it, yeah. uh, and and you receive uh, you know, uh, some notification on your palm to let you know that you are um, uh, you're uh, you're engaging with the system in a way you anticipate. So so you have a, a mental model in your head of how mm -hmm. you you think the system is engaging with you, uh, and and there's confirmation coming from the system to let you know that that's the way that's going, right? Uh, but you're not physically touching uh, anything. That's yeah. amazing. What 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 could be the future of this technology? Um, so the, the uh, there is a um, there are two elements to the future, right? So um, when you think about um, uh, so I, I mean let me draw an analogy with uh, um, if you think of, uh, just for simplicity with if you say Amazon, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so there's two ways to think about Amazon, right? So in the past, uh, someone would have characterized Amazon as a book selling online bookstore, right? Uh, and, 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 uh, um, uh, and, and, and that is, that is you characterizing Amazon through the lens of an application, which is bookstore. Uh, there's another way to think of Amazon, which is a, a cloud infrastructure mm -hmm. company, right? So that is through the lens of the technology that it, core technology that they have. So I think uh, as an academic, at the end of the day, I, I'm still back in my research lab and I am mm -hmm. working uh, in my research group. Uh, the, uh, uh, I'm always looking for what are the new opportunities for the tech that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and and the, um, uh, so, so we use the same uh, platform, um, but now we can, instead of giving you the sense of touch in your hand, uh, we float objects in air. So, uh, so you, if you have a small object that that is uh, uh, placed in that field, yeah, uh, that object is going to experience the same forces that your hand was experiencing before. So I can levitate these objects. <laughs> really, <clears throat> that's yeah. amazing. Uh, so, uh, so we do uh, acoustic levitation, mm -hmm. uh, and through that acoustic levitation, we can. Um, uh, we can create uh, not only a haptic device, but we can have visual device as well, right? So, uh, so we float uh, a small polystyrene bead in air, mm -hmm. and and I can update the position of this bead uh, at forty thousand frames per second, right? So really? we can move it really fast, so fast that your eye doesn't see anymore this bead moving, but instead mm -hmm. it sees uh, um, uh, some object in front of you. So it's a floating hologram. 
uh, and and so we are uh, so we do this kind of uh, uh, volumetric display uh, and and um, so that's something that we're working on right? so we're working on creating fully multimodal uh, displays where you can have this hologram you can touch it you can feel it you can hear from it as well mm -hmm. uh, so so that's uh, uh, one of the futures and i think uh, uh, we are hoping that uh, we can uh, 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 we can create uh, um, uh, applications where people have a fully immersive experience uh, with such a device um, and, and at the same time we are also looking at uh, um, more sophisticated uh, applications of uh, of touch itself so can we create uh, empathy and uh, uh, well-being and, and, and emotional mm -hmm. aspects of touch, right? So that's something that uh, uh, the company uh, and, and my lab with other collaborators across Europe uh, are looking at. So we want to, uh, we want you to really feel that you are hugging and touching mm -hmm. someone uh, digitally, not just uh, some fake tactile feedback. There are two things that I really like in your explanation. One thing is the let's start with the technical thing before we come to the to the life science part. Uh, I think it's really amazing this this hologram that you were talking about. So you hovering with uh, with sound waves, an yeah. object in the air, and you can can paint pictures. Yeah. So it, it reminds me a lot of uh, of Star Trek. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's true. I mean, a lot of people draw analogy with yeah. uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, whichever is your favorite <laughs> program. Yeah. Uh, um, and and uh, again, I think we do better than uh, really? both of them. Yeah. So uh, if you think of, um, uh, uh, well, let's go with Star Wars, right? So uh, yeah. the, uh, uh, the, the Princess Leia uh scenario that people always imagine right uh, coming uh, the <laughs> yeah. hologram coming out and asking for help mm -hmm. uh, so the um a lot of people only focus on the visual hologram mm -hmm. right uh, and and, uh, and and you can have a speaker that plays the sound which doesn't seem such a complicated thing mm -hmm. uh, but the, the advantage of what we do is that hologram uh, you can also feel it Right, so mm -hmm. you can bring a hand close, and you will feel the objects, and you will feel everything there. And the hologram speaks itself, so it's not that you have another speaker that's going to generate the sound. Wow. The sound is going to come from the hologram, so uh, so it's a fully multimodal in that sense. So it would be, an, I mean, at the ultimate stage, it would be. Let's let's stay with, with the technological stuff a little bit. I'm thinking about architecture, for example, when architecture draw plans. Uh, I mean, there. Are, it's the beginning, what I read on the internet, um, that they have now software where they can fully uh, draw 3D models. And your technology could enhance this process, basically, and bring them really to life so that people can touch it, can feel it, can flip it around, can see it, can zoom in and zoom out. Is that, is that really possible? Uh, I, I think so. Yeah, I, I strongly believe that we can uh, reach that uh, uh, scenario where uh, you can uh, interactively engage with your uh, content and not worry about uh, how the technology works. Just yeah. focus on the interactions. And everywhere. I mean, you brought up uh, Minority Report as, a, as an inspirational mm -hmm. movie mm -hmm. scene. Uh, and and uh, if we go by the same uh, arc, then, uh, you know, um, Iron Man had this scene where, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, Tony Stark is manipulating this mist and fog. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. That kind of, a, that is an architectural setting. So you can do the same thing. So uh, very much you can uh, pick it up, you can feel it, you can interact with it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the technology blends into the background and you focus on your task. Yeah. That's that's a great thing. When we go now to the to the picture that you painted with uh, Princess Leia in in yeah. Star Wars, I think one of the problems people currently with the lockdowns. I mean, we have the second one in Austria. One mm -hmm. problem they experience is not meeting friends, not meeting families, and yeah. uh, it's a little bit lonely. So not being mm -hmm. able to touch other people. And I think one important yeah. part of the human experience, and it's mm -hmm. also necessary, in my opinion to stay healthy mm -hmm. is basically really being in touch with people. Yeah. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this application. 
Uh, do you really, do you really, are you really confident that you can create uh, holograms of people that other people can touch and that you can feel? So, for, for example, holding hands. Yes, I think, I think so. That, um, there are two elements to that, right? First is the technological mm -hmm. know how of creating a, a tactile sensation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, that means that when I put my hand in a particular location, I want to be able to feel something, right? Uh, I, I think we are, uh, I feel more confident that we are there in terms of being able to do that. Uh, what I'm less clear, uh, and which is mm -hmm. where more work needs to be done, is what does it mean to be able to do that, right? So I want to shake your hand now, right, digitally. I, I can easily give you a, a piece of tech that yeah. sits on your side, and I can have a piece of tech on my side uh, that can recreate whatever is sent, uh, right? So whatever you send me as a touch, I can recreate on the side. But the problem is what should we send? What is that? When I put my hand in front of you, mm -hmm. every every is a wrinkle in my skin is holding onto your uh, hand. I don't even know what is the most salient feature of okay. this handshake, right? Okay. Is it the fact that I'm gripping you tight? Is yeah. it the fact that my palm is making contact with your palm? Yeah. What is it? And, 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 and you know, the way we shake hands, just a simple handshake conveys a lot of emotion, right? Uh, That's true. Leadership, authority, uh, everything comes through just, just this handshake. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, as an engineer, the first thing I worry is I don't even know how to capture that nuance. Mm -hmm. And without that, it will be a very simple, uh, uh, simple rubbing of your hand <laughs> because I don't know what to send. Uh, yeah. and, and, and people will sometimes mischaracterize that as a failure of the technology mm -hmm. in, in, in delivering the sense of touch. But I would say that that is a, a failure of our understanding of what it means to deliver that touch. It's the technology I, will do whatever you want to do, but uh, yeah, I, I think, know what to do. I think these are new questions. I mean, up to now, it was not necessary to think about uh, yeah. transmitting touch to yeah. a different location. When yeah. I think about the healthcare system, I mean, I have few ideas in mind. For example, mm. telemedicine is on the rise yeah. uh, with the lockdown. And uh, once a physician told me that basically he can uh, do all the diagnostics remotely so he doesn't uh, need to be a patient but there is one aspect uh, in the interaction with the, between physician and patient that uh, patients are more confident in the healing process when they feel the touch of the physician so when we uh, solve this uh, let's say philosophical questions, what to transmit yeah. and how to, yeah. how, how a handshake or how a touch feels. Uh, yeah. Basically, you could really enhance the agnostic with your technology. So yes, yeah, absolutely. And, and in fact, I, I can give you another example, which is not so, not of, uh, not telemedicine, it's more everyday Monday mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, so they've, they've talked about um, some quite a few years ago, so I don't know if it's still current or relevant mm -hmm. or not, but uh, where uh, if you are a waiter or a waitress, uh, if you touch the person uh, mm -hmm. in the restaurant on their shoulder, you will get a better tip. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so, you know, the sense of touch is important. So it, uh, yeah. all you have to do as a, as a, a, uh, as a waiting staff is just uh, um, uh, gently tap the person mm -hmm. uh, who's dining in your restaurant uh, to show them that you're friendly and and you you will get a better uh, uh, tip from them so mm -hmm. uh, you, there's a lot of things that touch is important for yeah. uh, and, and in fact we we even use the word let's stay in touch uh, even though uh, we don't actually physically touch each other uh, no, we are absolutely agree. We are living in a physical world. So I think yeah. generations of human beings were dependent on each other. They had yeah. to form communities for the mere fact of survival. I think uh, the world hundred years, a few hundred years ago was very hostile. And uh, I think this, this touching uh, is part of our human nature and also um, changes the hormones in the body. So I think this is also scientifically yeah. proven in my opinion. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yes, and then it's uh, the uh, that's how even like babies and uh, um, 
they can distinguish the touch of their mother from the touch mm -hmm. of strangers uh, and uh, an important part of uh, grooming in uh, primates uh, or monkeys is uh, you know uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, they establish hierarchy by uh, grooming the hair uh, mm -hmm. and that's a very uh, sensual uh, but important process uh, so yeah uh, it's very important uh, and, and if you don't understand enough uh, the, the the science uh, as well as the uh, the engineering of yeah. Uh, that yeah no, i think there's a lot of research that still can be done did you did you talk with the pharmaceutical industry already about possible applications uh, the pharmaceutical industry well i mean i think medical devices company or well-being companies are more uh, are closer to mm -hmm. uh, this kind of Uh, um, technology. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies have approached us uh, mm -hmm. in the past, but not so much for touch, but for the levitation side of things, right? So uh, I think there is some uh, interest in exploring uh, drug delivery mm -hmm. uh, in the, so the, one of the, uh, the visions Uh, would be that uh, you can uh, you can encapsulate a, a, a drug in a capsule and and you can acoustically deliver deliver the drug to specific locations in the human body mm -hmm. uh, and then release it there the so that uh, uh, yeah, yes yeah so so you we can use sound i mean we are not anywhere near being able to do that mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the technology itself because Uh, there's it's a it's a complicated if you want to control something inside a human body there are different uh, mediums and it's difficult to do that but um, yeah there, there are, the pharmaceutical industry has contacted us in the past for that mm -hmm. um, we we also get a lot of requests from life science research groups uh, who are interested in uh, suspending in free space Uh, um, uh, some insect or some uh, prey to see how a predator might approach the prey mm -hmm. uh, to understand uh, prey predator relationships um, and, and specifically to also understand how the, the genes in that prey or in the predator evolve uh, or how have evolved right so uh, there are a lot of applications there and, and uh, every time it's, it could be a zebra fish it could be a fruit fly it can be a dragon fly Uh, yeah, so uh, we get such requests as well to try. Yeah, let's stay a little bit creative. Uh, we got a question from the audience yeah. uh, from Dwayne Holland, and yeah. I will hand you the mic, Dwayne. Welcome to the show. So, hello there. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm fascinated. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, I thought you were just going to read my question, but I'm happy to uh, say it. Um, yeah, I'm really impressed with the technology. Thank you for the, the talk. So oh, you're welcome. Thank you. You mentioned very briefly, um, but just wondering how you could simulate the sense of touch to a specific individual. So you mentioned that um, uh, a touch of a, a mother's hand um, is very different to maybe, you know, a father's mm -hmm. even. Um, you didn't use that example, but I'm wondering mm -hmm. how you could get a specific individual because it's very nuanced and how you then yep. uh, capture that type of information to make it very personal. Yeah, well, that's a, that's what I was trying to say, uh, say uh, to Christian that that is a challenge. We don't know how to capture uh, that information, right? Uh, uh, and yet, somehow, our human body is able to capture that information. Information. So, when I shake my hand uh, with you or with Christian or uh, someone else, uh, I can capture all kinds of information just from that touch, even if we are blindfolded. Um, so uh, I, I think there is a, a lot of science that could be done uh, to uh, to understand how the different mechanoreceptors in our hands respond. So mechanoreceptors are the different receptors in our hand that respond to pressure and touch. Um, so yeah, so that's possible. And, and, and to be fair, there are many research labs that are looking at this aspect, uh, but we, we, have, we have not been able to fully integrate Uh, the whole pipeline, right? So from 
some sensory stimulation happening in my hand to how this information gets sent all the way through to the body and what happens in the brain and how is that all integrated and integration happens in the, in complicated ways because sometimes you can have a, a have visual information so i can see something and what i see may contradict what i feel and then my brain chooses uh, consciously or subconsciously to to listen to one channel of information and ignore the other channel there is the uh, rubber hand illusion i don't know if uh, people have heard of that uh, it's uh, it's where um, you know so you you, uh, you have a, a, a dark screen and your hands are through that screen so you don't see your hand anymore but then you see a digital uh, avatar of your hand um, and uh, whenever you move your finger the digital avatar moves exactly like it's your hand uh, and uh, and then uh, somewhere in the middle someone comes and chops that uh, digital avatar's hand and people shriek and pull their hand out even though you knew from the beginning that this was not real uh, mm-hmm. so uh, uh, yeah so so there, there's all kinds of fascinating illusions and uh, um, uh, integrations that happen uh, and and part of this challenge is going to be to understand how to bring all of that together yeah so i don't have a simple answer on how we do that Uh, um, uh, and I think what I was trying to say is that the simple answer is in once you tell me how to do it uh, or what is it that's being captured, uh, uh, the technology can be made ready to deliver that kind of information. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let's stay a little bit with, um, with the potential applications that uh, you can do, especially yeah. when it comes to, to health care. Um, I think of uh, surgeons, surgery, might that be a possibility? Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, you mentioned telemedicine before as well. And uh, um, yes, yeah, so, so uh, uh, surgery is, um, uh, is a very interesting and promising uh, avenue to explore. There are, um, there are a couple of aspects, right? So one could be actually in, uh, in a surgeon in, um, in a comfortable hospital uh, or in a, a com- comfortable setting doing teleoperation mm-hmm. at a remote setting uh, the other uh, so and, and so there there are all kinds of challenges and 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 it's possible to explore uh, um, a remote uh, haptic feedback mm-hmm. um, and, and and there are some companies that are doing such such explorations mm-hmm. um, the other thing could be uh, uh, education so uh, uh, if, if you're if you're doing a neuro uh, brain surgery training you cannot uh, open the brain uh, every time someone wants a training right so uh, there might be uh, there, there might be many uh, avenues there right so wh- one possibility is that a surgeon is doing something mm-hmm. uh, and, and and today you what you have is galleries right so and then uh, medical students are observing from a gallery Uh, what's going on uh, and, and another op- opportunity is for the medical students to feel what the surgeon is doing so mm-hmm. they also get and that's a very important uh, element so surgeons always have to feel uh, as much as they uh, they have to uh, precisely operate uh, yeah. and and yeah i mean this is one of the use cases i heard in the from the 5g world that which is usually brought up uh The best surgeon from the United States can then do mm-hmm. surgery remotely when the patient is in China or in Japan. And they always thought, uh, how can that happen? Because they, they really don't feel when what, what they touch and what they move. They just can mm-hmm. move the technical stuff, but don't get any, any tactile feedback. So with your technology, that could close that gap. Yes, yeah, I think, I mean, uh, it's... Uh it's not just our technology there are many mm-hmm. uh, many companies that are uh, specialists in uh, remote surgery mm-hmm. uh, support uh, and and you know surgeons all use anyway a specialist tool mm-hmm. tools for many things right and and if you ask them to perform even if it's a remote surgery if you ask them to perform just with the hand without those tools they will not be able to do it so they need that tool even yeah. if the tool is just a prop Uh, they they need that tool and and uh, what uh, some of these t- teleoperation companies are doing is they are giving uh, 
tactile feedback to the uh, to the surgeon mm-hmm. through those tools and props so the advantage in, in those settings is that the person is touching something so through that thing that you're touching you can give them the feedback mm-hmm. um whereas in some situations you cannot touch and then you still want to have that feedback yeah yeah so i mean in the education setting that you mentioned and when we bring it together with this uh princess uh leia uh picture from star wars so if yeah. i just make it up in my mind it sounds like that you fully can get they can draw a full hologram of a real person uh with in high detail and that surgeons can then practice with the hologram uh in a future vision and fully yeah. feel and experience uh, what they are doing is this did they get it right? yes yeah 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 you got it right you put it much better than me uh, uh but uh, yes I, i think that's uh, definitely possible the challenges uh, uh in in that scenario right now mm-hmm. are uh, the size of the hologram right so uh, the, the holograms that we can do today uh, are quite small i mean they are big compared to the state of the art in hologram technology mm-hmm. but uh, uh people are used to bigger size objects right so if you're talking about uh, a patient on a table that's uh, there will be some challenges in uh, um generating that size hologram mm-hmm. yeah but it's it's an interesting and achievable challenge i mean this is an all training situation i mean there there, there could yeah. be many every every time when you can can draw a hologram and make it mm-hmm. touchable yeah. i think the applications are endless unlimited yeah. so yeah Yes. Uh, self-driving cars, for example. I mean, the the, the big vision is that uh, Tesla or mm-hmm. Neo or uh, Chile or BYD that we mm-hmm. basically uh, are not in the driver's seat anymore. But in some situations, it would be very helpful. And I always thought, how will how will they do that? Because well, how how does a future car look like if it's self-driving? We don't need the driver's seat. But uh, when a person in the car needs to take over, you have to simulate then the uh the console and with your technology you could do that yes yeah yeah we can do that uh, i i think uh this in self driving cars uh, it's very easy for the car to say oh i don't know what to do you're the driver <laughs> take care of it yeah. right but obviously the situation that the car is encountering is quite complicated mm-hmm. otherwise if it's a trivial situation the car can handle that situation right Mm-hmm. uh so if it is not trivial and the and the responsibility has to go to the driver then the driver probably needs a little bit more time to understand what is the situation yeah uh, and and that so you can find nice ways in which you can interrupt the people and uh ask uh, uh um ask them to gracefully take control before mm-hmm. it becomes you know like uh, before the car is like okay you have two seconds now you go on to kill <laughs> kill that uh, child or do you want to yeah yourself by hitting the tree that's yeah impossible uh, i'm exaggerating but yeah that's yeah that's true twain has another question so twain i unmute you hello again hi um hello again. i was just wondering how strong the sensory feedback someone would actually receive so um so there's a sense of touch and then there's also mm-hmm. a sense of actually holding something as well which i'd oh, imagine you have pressure and so i was just wondering what could someone feel lifting a heavy weight in a gym for instance yeah so that's a excellent question yeah um so i've been quite careful to use the word tactile feedback um and 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 uh, so when you talk about the sense of touch or haptics there are two types of feedback right there's force feedback Uh, um and the tactile feedback force feedback is uh, when you you are holding something but also all your muscles are being engaged so uh, the um, the technology that we are developing in my lab and in my company you, you will not be able to have the kind of resistance as if you're lifting a weight in the gym right so that's not going to happen uh, the sensation is quite light you will definitely notice that there is some feedback but the feedback is not enough to restrain you or stop you from doing something uh, it's mostly a notification or a sense that you um, your skin has been stretched in different ways so you know something has happened uh, whereas some of the things that uh, dwayne was asking are uh, stopping the person from completely doing something that one yeah thank you i mean there was this um 
<laughs> lifting weights in the gym. There was uh, in in Star Trek there was this uh, holodeck holodeck so where mm, people could yeah, yeah. draw up yeah. entire worlds. Yeah. Uh, do you really think this is feasible to push uh, the research that is going on in that field and the development uh, where you are part of that we really can make that possible? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I, there are many already, I, I feel like Google and so on have mm -hmm. uh, what they call a holodeck or their interpretation of the holodeck in their uh, offices in San Francisco. Really? Um, uh, but uh, the, 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 the vision of holodeck that you are describing and that's in Star Trek is a little bit more sophisticated, but it's certainly doable. I don't really... I don't, I don't think there's anything challenging or uh, that is stopping us from creating those scenarios except mm -hmm. the scale right um, and and uh, and part of the uh, creating that size holodeck environment is going to be what you're going to use it for and how much can you afford to pay for something mm -hmm. that that's going to be the issue and uh, <clears throat> from a progressing the knowledge or the of a particular discipline or uh, in uh, understanding more the science, you don't gain that much by pouring millions into making such a big uh, holotech, uh, but a small, like one person in front of them, it's possible. And uh, yeah. and that's enough to study um, the, the engineering challenges around it. Yeah. I mean, there's one thing that I miss. I, so my life basically until last year was that I traveled the world for conferences to get in touch with investors, with the pharmaceutical industry, with mm -hmm. scientists. And I think there are 10 to 20 key conferences in the world. And most of the contacts um, I had were accidentally uh, mm -hmm. just being in a room with a few thousand people. So in, in yeah. large halls and yeah. having a coffee with them and talking yeah. and shaking hands. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is all gone since March. So everything yeah. went digital and yeah. it's, a, it's a different dynamic. I mean, I like it. I like talking to people. So I enjoy this conversation we're having right now, yeah. Yeah. but I would prefer to have it in person to see and uh, also yeah. to feel the people and also have a, an audience in a room and not just yeah. virtually in a chat box. Yeah. Um, one application that uh, could could bring that back would basically what you say, uh, I mean, let's just assume the money is not an issue. So yeah. having a fully touchable virtual conference with hundreds and thousands of people that are basically holograms. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that yeah, so that that means you you are um, you have a full size or some kind of an avatar of you mm. uh, and and uh, the, that's engaged in that virtual world somehow. Uh, I think this is something that people are looking at, and you're absolutely right. Right, the uh, one of the advantages of attending those face-to-face -face events is the serendipitous networking opportunity that mm. people got. Uh, and and, and uh, maybe those kind of conferences are not as attractive now as they were before because serendipity is almost gone from the equation. Uh, you're, you're going to go into, a, even if you have breakout rooms, you're going to go into the breakout room where you think you have the best chance of meeting someone. Uh, and, 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 and you were doing that even before in a live conference setting, but uh, there were more chances of you to bump into different people yeah. And there was an opportunity for someone to just walk up to you and start talking to you. Yeah, uh, and, 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 and virtual worlds offer that to the best they can. Uh, and and, and uh, yeah, that's something that uh, people are looking at, uh, different virtual, uh, like I think Mozilla uh, has a, a, a virtual world uh, mm -hmm. and there are other virtual worlds as well. So yeah, it's yeah, an I think interesting space. Touch is also important to build trust between people. I always see yes, yeah. digitally. Digital is one way, but this, this, I think there is more trust building yeah. in the process when people are in the same room physically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. When we we stressed it a little bit further, I mean, we can come up probably with, with endless visions what would be possible. But what are the current challenges right now that you face at the UCL and that? Actually, your company is facing. What are the immediate challenges that you need to solve? So, I, I think um, uh, from uh, our research group's perspective, the um, we are we are 
looking at how to scale the size of the holograms we can generate. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and, and maybe reduce our reliance on, um, or reduce the, the amount of hardware resources we use mm -hmm. to generate. So we want to cut down and so that we can make it more mass producible in a way, right? So that's something that we're looking at in our lab. Um, and, and from the company's perspective, yes, I think uh, the cha the interesting challenge would be to to see if it's if you can integrate holograms uh, into the uh, uh, into the offering, right? So right now, uh, people can clearly see a value add for uh, giving touch and mm -hmm. for touchless spatial interaction, but uh, to uh, to ask them to uh, to to or to, to if you were thinking about like a kiosk or a cinema uh, a booking machine, would you really want to have a hologram in front of you? Uh, it's not uh, clear what is the value added there from a purely transactional interaction. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think I think that the company might uh, think about what are those uh, uh, non-transactional interactions that people might want to have. Mm -hmm. where uh, such technology can be useful. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that's, a, uh, that's an interesting uh, problem to explore. So it's, it's more, the, more the philosophical aspects, basically what people yeah. want, uh, yeah. how society works and uh, how people yeah. are satisfied in the, in the customer yeah. experience. Um, yeah. We are coming close to the, to the end of the talk. So we, yeah. we said one hour and yeah. uh, I would like to ask you the, the final question and also give a call to the audience whether they have one or the other question uh, yeah. popping up. Um, you started your company in 2013. Yeah. And uh, I know that in the audience of the podcast, um, we have a lot of young scientists who yeah. <laughs> are tending in the same direction to yeah. become a scientific entrepreneur. What key advices, what three key advices would you give these young scientists? Oh, wow, yes, uh, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think one of the first things I would say is um, that there are, there might be challenges in the journey, but the, uh, always the journey is entertaining and it's a good learning experience. So I've enjoyed a lot and I've learned a lot. So uh, don't be afraid to try. Right, uh, and especially if you're a scientist and you have a university infrastructure and a system in place, the great thing is universities now recognize the need to allow people to explore those commercial opportunities. So uh, they all they always have a scaffold, uh, and and they provide soft landing for you. Right, when you fail, you're coming back to the soft landing of the university environment. Uh, which you cannot get uh, easily anywhere else. So use it. And, and, and that is, again, uh, going back to the point of don't be afraid to fail. Right? And I think, uh, uh, so, so then the, the third advice is uh, what anyone in the uh, business world says, right? try fast, uh, fail fast and move on. Right? So if you have this, uh, this urge to see whether your idea is a commercially viable proposition, just go for it, find out if it works. Uh, and if it does, then well done. If not, nothing wrong. I mean, uh, you tried, gave it a good shot and it's time to go on to the next adventure. I think those would be the, the, the things that I would say are lessons I learned. Yeah. So, sound advice, uh, just yeah. don't be afraid, be bold, go out, do things. Uh, let's assume we are talking about the future. So let's assume that uh, also time travel is possible. And uh, you could have the chance, so let's say maybe Tesla or, uh, or Google brings it up and makes it really happen. So you have a chance to travel 10 years into the future and uh, mm -hmm. meet your future self in, in 10 years time. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you can have a conversation with uh, your future self and ask one question mm -hmm. and say, uh, what was the most important goals and actions that you set in 2021 that made you successful? What would be the answer of your future self to that question? What is it? Whoa. <laughs> uh, 
what did you set in 2021? So what did I set next mm -hmm. year that I would feel is uh, take risks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be the, uh, I think that, uh, that would be my, uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, I, I believe truly in this notion that uh, being in an university environment gives you the soft landing that you need. So uh, aim for the sky. Uh, I mean, yeah, so I, I would say that, that that is the philosophy that's ingrained in the way I work. And that's probably what I would be doing in 2021, aim for something big. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you aim for the sky and you miss it, you will still be on a treetop. That's but true. if you aim for a treetop and you miss it, you're still on the ground. So it doesn't really help. Yeah. So yes, it's, it's also something. Do. It's also something Bruce Lee said uh, that goals are not always meant to be achieved. Just aim yeah. high, have big yeah. visions, and go for yeah. it. Sidam, thank you very much for your time and for your talk. Uh, all yeah. the best for your for the development of your company and your research at the UCL. I'm looking yeah. very much forward to find your technology once it hits the stores in Austria. Uh. Yeah, thank you so much, Christian. It was lovely to talk to you and uh, great to, uh, uh, to hear from the audience as well. So yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs> you too. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Please, please share the podcast and make sure you've subscribed. Have a great day. <laughs>